if you guys could just, if maybe as I introduce you, give you a, a little bit more about yourselves. Um, I, so Megan's our first uh, person here, and she's going to be doing a PowerPoint presentation. Mer Megan is currently with, or just recently with, almost uh, Ontario Culture Days, and now hopefully everyone who's involved in a community has been involved with Culture Days at some point in time. Great uh, way to get culture out to your community and, and that aspect. Not, it usually happens last weekend in uh, September, mm -hmm. first week of October, kind of thing. Um, so Megan it has a museum, is a museum professional in the Toronto area uh, with over five years of experience in arts programming, outreach and administration. She's held positions at a variety of cultural institutions from within Alberta and Ontario, including the Art Gallery of Alberta, the Town of Oakville, so I don't know if you to work in Brampton, so. uh, the Royal Museum, uh, Royal Ontario Museum. Uh, Megan acquired uh, her Master of Museum Studies at the University of Toronto and a Bachelor of Fine Arts in History at Queen's. Uh, she's passionate about public programming and, vis and visitor research within the museum sector. Did you want to add more to that? Um, no, I mean, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, yeah, so I am going to be uh, talking a little bit about Culture Days, uh, the network we have, um, starting sort of broad, looking at the whole country, but really getting down into the province itself, um, and talking about how we're able to create so many, as many programs as that do take place over the Culture Days weekend uh, through working with the Mad Network model. That's about it. Oh, and what's that PowerPoint? Yay, we have PowerPoint. Good. Pretty, pretty. Pritam. Pritam. I apologize. Pritam. Uh, Pritam is uh, with the Folk Music Ontario. Okay. Uh, and uh, basically, you're a musician yourself. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> basically, a musician. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, but not storytelling describes his uh, music beat. Uh, live shows. Uh, his live shows are built around. Uh, simple performance, playful uh, stage banter, and a very uh, little pyro. I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, that, that scares me. I've been building a bird down a, a couple of times, so. Um, <laughs> While the comparison must uh, uh, often goes uh, the other way, uh, your niece has said that uh, Paul Simon sounds like you. Well, that's a very nice compliment. Yeah. Uh, we're pretty sure Mr. Simon is unaware of this. So. Uh, uh, now that sort of gives me a basic little bit, that, and I know you've just had an album finished and uh, released. I, I did, yeah. I yeah. released an album in September. It was nice. Nice. It was fun to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, last on the list, I, I know Eric from too many meetings now. I think we, we um, Eric is here uh, as the theater coordinator of the Fergus uh, Grand Theater, so at Rural Space. Uh, founding member of the Community Presenters Network, uh, owner and operator of Grinder Productions, a live theater company, playwright, director, producer, designer, educator, also a steering committee member of Spark. So again, if you have any questions about Spark, Eric will help you out as well. Um, that's it for me. That's it. You guys go ahead. Go at it for networking yeah. between really the networks. Bios to <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I think we have we each have about 20 minutes of uh, things to chat about. That'll be a loose so. 20 for some of us. <laughs> um, and then I think we probably have time for some questions or discussion afterwards. Uh, we didn't talk about who wants to go first. We kind of said you were going to Oh, you were going to go first. It's finally working. I think you so guys have the hard act to follow. <laughs> I'm just going to have to make do with pyrotechnics. Yeah, that's a true. Little How am I going to do with pyrotechnics? <laughs> Megan's going to be up here, and then I'm going to bring it right down here, and then Eric can come in the middle and get yeah, off really yeah. nicely. I feel like that'll be Raise your hand when you want the slide change. That's good. Okay. Or I'll just, I'll just say slide or something. Okay. Um, yeah. And hopefully I don't forget when I want my slide. <laughs> um, all right, so I am just going to start by uh, introducing Culture Days for anyone uh, who doesn't know a little bit about our organization. Can just go to the next one? Um, slide. Oh, yeah, slide. slide. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. See, if you can bring all the text, I don't. I guess. I, oh, that's just the way it's playing. Great. That's good. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, Culture Days is a weekend to celebrate the role of arts and culture in our communities. 
Um, so it started in 2010, so we are just, we actually just had our eighth year, we're going into our ninth year now, um, and next year's going to be our 10 year anniversary, which we're really excited about. Um, and it is, uh, as I said, about exploring that role of arts and culture in our communities. It's been really taken up by a lot of municipalities, arts organizations, uh, independent artists, uh, lots of different local community groups, pretty much anyone who's interested in getting involved in Culture Days is able to do that. Um, it always takes place the last weekend in September, so this year that's going to be September 28th, 29th, and 30th. Um, and uh, it's, it's not prescriptive, so anyone who wants to make an arts and culture event is able to do that. Um, the only real restrictions um, on it being part of Culture Days and registered on the Culture Days website is that it's free, uh, free to access, or at least some portion of it is free. Um, and uh, that we encourage all the programs to be participatory as well. So uh, as we talked a little bit about um, even in that, uh, like uh, at lunch, um, we sort of broached on the fact that often participatory or sort of hands-on programming um, tends to have a greater return in people coming back and being more involved in arts and culture in their communities in the long run. So um, the goal being that uh, through participating in Culture Days programming, or even just arts and culture in people's communities all through the year, um, we'll be able to raise that awareness, accessibility, and participation um, of Canadians in the arts and cultural lives of their communities all throughout the year. So not just the last three days in September. Slide? <laughs> uh, and text? I wish I had. <laughs> all right, that's good. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so to break down our approach, um, our call to action for Canadians, so visitors taking part in the program, is to get out and support arts and culture in their communities during that weekend. If you're already someone who participates in arts and culture regularly, which I feel like all of us probably are, um, it's always a great, great opportunity to bring up friends and family and neighbors and everything like that. Um, again, because it is not prescriptive, we got a huge variety of programs, um, and so uh, it's great because we're able to see where areas of the community are really engaged um, and interested in activating culture in that area. Um, and then it's good for the public because they're really able to get some kind of programming that suits people. There's something for everyone. Everyone can always find something that works well for them. Um, again, focusing on that idea of the programs being free and participatory really makes it approachable as well. Um, and hopefully someone's able to find something that fits their niche and then that they want to return to later. Slide. Oh. It'll be slower afterwards, I promise. I have like a whole bunch of slides at first, and then, yeah, next one. Oh, it's done. Yeah. Oh, can you hit next? Okay. There we go. Um, all right, so uh, last year in Canada, um, which this is a little washed out, but maybe you can kind of see the country. <laughs> um, there was uh, over 7,000 events in 800 cities, towns, hamlets, and First Nations communities all across the country. So that was just last year. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you can see Ontario. Um, so this is oh man, uh, the, the province, is <laughs> just kind of there, <laughs> um, and uh, you can see that we have activities all over the province, um, it's not just in those major urban centres. Um, we had 1,500 activities in Ontario in 2017. Um, this map shows uh, like the collective activities um, that happened in each one of these regions over our eight years. Um, and that was over 150 communities that participated in Culture Days. Um, We've had a number that actually took place in this community. I think there was 25 to 30 this year in sort of the Temiskaming Shores, Cobalt, and New Liskert area, which is great. Um, awesome. Oh, I was supposed to say slide. You're on the ball. <laughs> um, so uh, I, this is a topic about networking, so I'm going to get into that. Um, so obviously, we'd not be able to make 7,000 programs across the country or 1,500 programs within the province without working off of some kind of network and that collective sort of power and organization of all different arts professionals all over the province. Um, the National Office is situated in Toronto, um, and that it dictates a lot of the sort of focus and direction of the organization, um, but really it's not hierarchical. So a lot of the, each sort of piece kind of listens to the others. Um, the, the provincial office uh, is in each one of the provinces, obviously, um, and they have a little bit more of a hand in the actual programming that's taking place and helping to direct some of the community organizers to, the, to create specific programs for Culture Days. Uh, the community organizers are arts and cultural professionals who are really active in their communities. Uh, 
who are big advocates for culture days and think it really fits <coughs> well with the mandate and focus of their organizations. Um, the event organizers are people who might be just planning an event for the culture days weekend um, and aren't really too involved with us for the rest of the year. Um, and then obviously the public who show up on the culture days weekend itself. So if we can go to the next slide. So jumping into Ontario, um, being part of Ontario Culture Days, that's the network that I understand the best. Um, as you saw, the Ontario network's made up of the executive director as well as staff members like myself, who work very closely with the national office uh, to have some of that direction in the organization. Um, we also listen and work a lot with our community. Oh, am I on the right side? Darn it. Sorry, guys. Um, so we also work a lot with our community organizers uh, who have, as I said, that really direct input into their, the organizations and just sort of a good idea of what's happening in their communities. Um, those event organizers um, are people who are creating one or more events across Ontario. Um, and as I said, they're not really too engaged with the year, but we do interact a lot with them sort of in the lead up to Culture Days. So how do we manage all these organizers? Um, again, the answer is creating a network. <laughs> um, so our community organizers are a huge help in remaining active all throughout the year. This isn't just something where we reach out to them in August, deal with them, interact with them until September, October, and then that's it. Um, they have really good insights into how they want to see Culture Days fitting into their communities. They relay that back to us. And then they talk really directly with the event organizers um, to try and see and help that take place. Um, they support the event organizers quite a bit also in the development of their programs as well. So if they s see an organization that maybe isn't taking part or could be partnering with other organizations, they help to make some of those connections. Um, once an individual or site has decided to be a little bit more involved in the network, um, this is where they, uh, we kind of step in and help give them a little bit more direction about Culture Days. Can we go to the slide back? Um, we also have our community leads. Um, so these are a handful of community organizers spread about the province who have volunteered to have the added responsibility of maintaining a more holistic understanding of culture days in their areas. So they provide us a really good understanding of the direction of arts and culture in their communities, um, maybe identify some holes, um, and are good at suggesting ways that we really need to grow and adapt to better serve that community and the culture days programming that's happening in it. If we need to call up someone and say like, hey, what's happening in the like Temiskaming area? There's, you know, we have someone that we can call and get that, get that perspective. Um, so as you can see, there's lots of different ways that we have involvement in members of our network. Um, and trying, a lot of them fit together. Um, like the community leads are some, oh, almost always community organizers who sometimes are event organizers. And it's almost like a bit, bit of a Venn diagram of a lot of overlap. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the network hasn't been static over the history of Culture Days. Um, when we first started in 2010, uh, the community organizers were small enough that we were able to have really direct interactions with people. Um, we could sort of get their suggestions, give feedback, etc. Um, and it was sort of a little bit, a little bit easier to, to have those one-on-ones. Um, as it started to grow, we developed something called the task force. Uh, so the task force were any community organizers who wanted to be a little bit more involved in Culture Days. We started to have things like webinars, um, there was like an online forum where people could chat, uh, we would have emails back and forth, um, and so this was a little bit more of an opportunity for them to sort of direct the flow of Culture Days and what they wanted to see. Um, over the past eight years, uh, the task force expanded to eight, uh, about 100 people. So even though this was, we were happy to see, uh, I guess, this pickup in interest, it started to become a little bit more unwieldy for that smaller network perspective and really trying to get that feedback we were looking for. Um, we started to do some community consultation with members of the network because we wanted to really figure out what people were wanting to get out of it and how they really saw culture days fitting within their organization and within their goals for their community. We've sort of, we figured out that there were a few different perspectives. Uh, some people who were in the task force really wanted to be part of the task force because they thought they could help uh, grow and evolve Culture Days and uh, give us that feedback so that way our organization could adapt for their communities. Um, there were also people who really saw it as an opportunity to network with other arts pro professionals, maybe people who were working in similar sized areas as they were. 
um, and we're looking for a little bit more of that professional development aspect. We sort of felt like the task force as it stood wasn't giving everybody what they wanted, so we started to develop that community lead role. So we reached out to a few people to see if they were interested in sort of increasing that involvement, but really maintaining, as I said, that holistic and sort of overarching understanding of how Culture Days was fitting within their municipality, um, and then being able to give us that feedback so uh, we could make suggestions to them and they could make suggestions to us to how programming should be evolving. Um, if we can just go to the next one over, next slide. So this isn't to say that we did away with the organizer network or the task force. Obviously, if you've got an active network of people there, there's lots of different ways that we can keep engaging people. Um, it was really important for us to be able to have those dialogues and a bit of that community consultation to figure out how people wanted it to evolve, so that way we could find a solution that fit the needs both of our organization as well as the members of our network as well. Um, it was definitely a learning curve, um, as I think, uh, well, as, as Wendy mentioned, uh, I'm pretty, pretty new to the organization. Um, and so when I came in, we did have that really big task force. Um, so it was a bit of a learning curve for me to, ch to get to know everybody and to sort of see how people wanted to fit within Culture Days. Um, so how do we maintain the network and ensure that people are staying engaged? Um, we have a number of tools to maintain engagement. I've already talked about it just a little bit. Um, all of our organizers, such as like the leads, the community organizers, the event organizers, etc., are encouraged to sign up for our newsletter for Major Culture Days News. It's sort of a big way that we, we get the word out there, like a lot of organizations. Um, people are also connected on our social media accounts, just sort of the, the general places where we, again, share big updates, um, but also share good news stories about arts and culture things happening around the province. Um, we created a Facebook group called the Organizer Network. So this was in response to people who were really wanting that professional development and opportunities to network within other people in the organization. Uh, so we invited everyone who was part of that, uh, the task force to the Organizer Network um, in the hopes that people would start to create dialogues within one another. So if we, for example, if I like read a really great article and I think someone else might like it, I'll post it there. Um, and vice versa, if there are other people from all over the province who see something exciting or uh, read something they want to share, or even if they're doing a really neat program, uh, they tend to post it on the Facebook group and then people can see. Um, we've also had some good opportunities for dialogue. For example, very, within the past month, we had someone um, who was working on a mural project in his, his community. And he'd never done that before, and so he posted on the group asking a few questions just to see if anyone had also worked on a mural project before. And we had a few responses. So it was nice to be able to fit that dialogue in and connect people who maybe were working in similar size communities but were geographically quite far apart. Um, so we also have a few one-on-ones with people. Again, it's great to be able to pick up the phone and call someone or have an email. Um, even though we have lots of ways to communicate with folks, sometimes it's just really great to have a sit down in a meeting. I got the chance when I was driving up here to go to Huntsville. We have a number of partners there and, and have a few more interactions. So um, it's, I do find that there's nothing, nothing beats face to face when you're maintaining a network. We find that the um, sort of this tiered approach to having all the different kinds of groups really helps people can hear uh, from us about as much or as little as they want. Um, yeah, I'm sure everyone has that. You know, you, you, there's the people who want one, one email a month and then there's people who want to talk you know, once or twice a week. Um, and so having these different kinds of, uh, sort of opportunities within our network mean that people can really hopefully find a space that fits for them. So I've talked quite a bit about our network and uh, sort of how we work together for Culture Days. But um, one thing that we do want to help to provide is opportunities for, for growth and providing value to our network members all throughout the year. Um, so we do have um, a few things that we do. Uh, we provide some programming support both for the Culture Days weekend and just the opportunities to again have dialogues and advice for any programming. Um, I always encourage people to send me an email or have a phone call if they're stumped on a programming idea. Um, and there's maybe something that we've run into or have someone we know, we know who's interacted with something similar and we can be able to work through that or even just spitball a programming concept. Um, we also work on networking. I've already talked about how we try and connect different sort of arts professionals. 
um, not just in terms of uh, the Facebook group and getting advice, uh, but we've been really promoting this idea of partnership with a lot of the Culture Days programs. When we were doing that community consultation and feedback sessions, we found a lot of our partners were saying that they were <coughs> feeling pretty taxed. They were stretched, they didn't have the programming time, they sometimes felt like because it was all happening on one weekend, they were competing with other arts organizations for, for visitorship. Um, and so we, we started to work with a few people to create these partnership models. So one or more arts organizations that would create one Culture Days program with a few different pieces coming together. Um, it's really great for the visitor side because you can go and there's everything all at one centralized location. It's likely that you're going to be able to find something for everybody there. Um, but in terms of the organizational standpoint, it helps to spread out resources, helps to spread out staff time, um, and again, there's less of that competition for visitors. Uh, we like to help people in our network uh, be able to make some of those connections if they reach out to us. There's likely someone we know nearby who we can suggest to partner up with that. Um, but even if it's not related to culture days, if someone says like, hey, I'm doing something next month, I, you know, I need to reach out to a textile artist, do you know anybody? It's likely, or sometimes we do. Um, and so it's, we're able to help support those connections and then hopefully, fingers crossed, later they do something for culture days. And if not, that's okay too. <laughs> um, lastly, we also try and provide a number of resources to members of our network. Um, I work closely with the national office to develop these professional development webinars. Um, so we do them on all sorts of topics relating to partnership and these hub models that I just talked about. Um, we have ones on like, we had one recently on municipal cultural planning, on volunteer management, and we reach out to arts professionals who we think have a really good handle on these topics and uh, invite them to come to speak for 15 minutes on the webinar um, and just get a few people in there in that panel style of discussion. Um, again, a lot of these resources are able to support people in the development of their programs, not just for the Culture Days weekend, but hopefully through their arts organizations year-round. Um, there's also a number of like tip sheets and toolkits and things like that to support programming ideas, uh, and those are all up on the national website. Um, so if you're ever looking around and you want to see some resources, uh, if you go to the National Culture Days website, um, you can see quite, quite an extensive list of the toolkits we have there. Especially now that uh, so many of our resources are digital, we do find that uh, a lot of people who are able to participate in the webinar are, again, coming from rural communities. Um, and it's nice for us that it's able to expand that reach beyond um, again, just us in our office in the GTA to be able to interact with lots of different organizations from all over the province. Go to the next slide. This is the last one. <laughs> um, so, why do we have this network and why does it work for us? Um, I've already talked quite a bit about program capacity. There's no way that we would be able to produce the number of programs that we do without the very dedicated members of our network who see the value in Culture Days and really think that it aligns with a lot of the mandates and focuses of their institutions. Um, it's also great for us that we have so many different people choosing to participate in lots of different arts organizations um, because it means that there's lots of different voices that come out over the Culture Days weekend. Um, we get a lot of insight into what fits best in those communities and people are always more than happy to tell us about what's working, what's not, and certain areas that we need to grow to help support that network and the program development taking place. Um, another great thing is that we're able to learn from the experiences of others. Um, again, with that, uh, talking about the Facebook group or some of the chats we have going on, the webinars, that kind of stuff, um, we're really able to tap into that collective brain power of a lot of the different arts and culture professionals all across the province and all across the country. Um, I think that all of us, I'm sure, are low on, re low on time, low on resources, and so being able to take advantage of a lesson learned by someone else um, and being able to apply that really cuts down on some of that learning process um, and hopefully saves everybody a little bit of time. Um, we're also able to help speed up that process of partnership because we already have that existing network base. And we do want to reach out both for us to partner with arts organizations or to help them partnering with each other. Um, they're really able to, I think because we have that common ground, we're already part of that network, uh, our foot's already in the door and we're able to really sort of help support those connections being made. 
Um, it's always easy when you know, you're not having to introduce yourself and start from scratch. Uh, I find that people are a little bit more open to, to starting a dialogue about different kinds of partnership. Um, in preparing for this, I've been doing a little bit of reading uh, and looking at some networking models and research. Um, I was recently reading a text called Net Games, a handbook for network building builders seeking social change by Peter Plastrick and Madeline Taylor. Um, and it highlights a number of benefits of using the network model, um, specifically looking at it to increase capacity, um, to create opportunities of rapid growth through the direct connection of people who may have common interests, even if they're geographically separate. Um, I definitely find that my own experiences with Culture Days really do relate to that. I, it, resonates quite well with me. Um, I find that being part of this network has been really invaluable in growing and adapting within the province as all of us collectively learn together. Um, and it's really been a great learning experience for me, especially being new to the organization, um, to be able to reach out to members of the network who, even if they're not a staff member with Culture Days, have been doing Culture Days for much longer than I have, and really being able to get a lot of good, valuable insights into uh, good programming models and suggestions for how to move forward. So as I said, we've got our 10 year anniversary coming up next year. Um, so we have two more Culture Days week, well, this one and, and the next one. Um, and so I'm really excited to see how the network's going to grow over the next few years, um, and as well as hear some of the suggestions from members of our network on how we should be celebrating our 10 year anniversary. So that's about it. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Or do we want to do questions now, or wait until the end? Wait until the end. Okay, we'll wait until the end. Great. Right, thanks. all going to say a lot of similar things when we're talking about the importance of, of networks. We just love networks. <laughs> yeah. and, and networks. So um, I'm here on behalf of Folk Music Ontario. Uh, Alka Sharma, who is our executive director, couldn't be here or else she would be sitting in this chair and not me. Um, she is at our board meeting that I'm skipping like a bad board member. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to come here because I've been, I came to the 2016 uh, event and really enjoyed it and thought I can't miss this so I, I told them that I was not coming. Um, so as uh, Wendy mentioned in that wonderful introduction I am basically a, a musician uh, <laughs> but I do uh, a number of different things uh, as well. I sit on the board of directors for Folk Music Ontario which is what I'm here to speak about. Uh, I also um, I'm a partner in an organization that runs a one-day uh, event for hip-hop artists looking to develop their careers internationally. So we do that in Toronto uh, every summer. And uh, we also present uh, a showcase in the south of France uh, every June, it seems, as well. So um, some international connections, uh, but it all comes out of relationship building. And that's kind of what I wanted to speak about in terms of networking. Uh, just how important it is uh, to be open, to be accepting, and to just go into things and let things happen. Um, but I should talk about Folk Music Organ Ontario, the organization, and, and who we are and what we do, because that's what I was invited to do. Um, Folk Music Ontario, some people are familiar with our uh, organization, yes? yes? Some are, some aren't. Uh, so we are a folk music uh, organization, believe it or not, uh, based in Ontario. Which is <laughs> not really just a clever name, uh, but that's actually what we are. Um, as, as part of our organization, we uh, host uh, the largest national folk music conference um, where there are uh, opportunities for uh, artists, for presenters, for festivals. So our, our organization uh, has members, uh, three tiers of membership, and those are individuals which are uh, folkies, like artists, fans, friends, um, or organizational memberships, which might be concert series presenters, um, small organizations, and then the festival members, which are uh, the history of the organization started as the Ontario Council of Folk Festivals. So it started as a, as a festival thing and it has grown into the folk music community at large. So 
there are a lot of individual members now. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, we do host the uh, national, you know, de facto national folk music conference, which uh, coincidentally will be at the end of September this year. Which the last week in September? It's the last weekend of September this year. I didn't think I knew that. So we might have culture days at our event. Great. And yeah. there we've just networked with a network. It's a full circle. It's a full circle. <laughs> but I, I mean, listening to, to Megan speak, it, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of, whether it's our festivals, whether it's presenters, whether it's our artists, there are opportunities to partner with, uh, you know, organizations like Culture Days, and to if they have shows, if they have whatever going on, um, you know, cross promotion and taking advantage of, of the networks that you're already a part of, uh, and developing your own, which is something that happens uh, at our conference. Um, the basics of the conference are there are a lot of showcases, so a lot of um, music happening uh, all day and all night, uh, late into the night, which is a lot of fun for us. Um, but there are educational panels, uh, workshops, uh, discussions, one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings, uh, so dedicated networking opportunities, which is something that uh, I enjoy in uh, events like this. So when you're given two hours for lunch, that's not just, you know, it's not just a thing where people give you two hours for lunch so you can run around and do things. It's to, to really meet people and to connect with people. And if you're open to that and, and take advantage of that, you can really gain some great relationships. Um, so we do have that. We also have a uh, developing artist program as part of our conference, which is for uh, people aged 15 to 21, uh, with a mentor um, to sort of keep the next generation of, of folkies going. Um, it's a great program. They have their own showcase, uh, and we it's usually one of the more popular events of the weekend. For those who have been there, you've seen it. It's it's a wonderful event. So, uh, it's a great program that's that's run really well. So, um, another thing that we do is Art Beat, which is a uh, unique to Folk Music Ontario, I believe, where as part of the conference, um, we send artists out to uh, schools in the community or hospitals or penitentiary or uh, you know senior shops. Those two. Anywhere. Yeah. You know, I, I, I went to a mental health drop-in center once for a performance, which was really great. Uh, and it gives an artist an opportunity to connect with people to bring folk music somewhere where folk music isn't traditional, uh, which is a really great program that we have as part of what we do. Um, the Export Development Program brings in uh, delegates from all across the world uh, to speak with uh, artists uh, managers, organizations, uh, trying to expand uh, Canadian folk music out to other people and to bring artists to perform here as well. So it's a, it's a really nice thing to bring uh, our little world closer together, which is always important. Uh, what else was I going to tell you about the conference itself? I think that might have been it. The one thing that you said that really resonated was the idea of like face to like nothing beats face to face mm -hmm. yeah. right and that's what that conference is for us it's that one time and that's what this event is you know the the, the network as the ongoing throughout the year is really important and it's really great to have that social media presence and to have those newsletters and to have all of that information going out to people but it really doesn't top when we're all here together in a room being able to you know vibe off each other and interact with each other um, and just to, like as an example, I was, uh, I was at a conference last week and uh, I was speaking to an artist uh, from Sweden. I told Lynn this story yesterday. I was speaking to an artist from, uh, from Sweden that I, that I know and, and had a great chat with her. And I said, oh, you've got a new project coming up. And she said, yeah. It's, I said, what does it have to do with horses? Like I saw you post something about horses. And she said, oh, well, you know, I, I'm... I'm releasing a song, like I used to love riding horses, but I haven't put my music with horseback riding together. I'm like, well, not many people do that, so I don't think you're alone. But uh, she said, I'm releasing this new song, so I'm getting people who have interest in horses to give me shout outs on little videos, and I'm putting them all as part of the campaign for this new song. I said, oh, that's really great. And I said, you know what? I know someone in where I live 
back home in Canada that has a radio show about horses. <laughs> she said, really? I said, do you want me to connect you? She said, that would be great. So I connected the two of them, you know, on, on Facebook and, and just said, meet each other. You know, Ade has a new song coming out about horses. Kim has a show about horses on the radio. Talk. And, you know, it was two days later that Kim had sent a message and said, my 10 o'clock guest canceled. Do you have the song? Can I play some of the videos? So this girl from Sweden was over the moon that this little radio show in Canada was, was putting her songs on the radio and, and telling her story. And I thought, you know what, that's not happening without us going out and building these relationships. That's, and, and me being where I was and having that conversation with her was how that happened. You know, and I have nothing to gain from that. It really doesn't do anything, and it doesn't matter to me. But the fact that we were able to get, you know, someone from Sweden to have some a connection in Canada, to me, feels pretty darn good. You know, so that face to face. So I guess the the importance of it all is to to really be open to everybody that you meet and you come across, and you never know who's going to be what in your life at what time. Um, you know, I, I attend a lot of events. Uh, across the country, across the world, and, and people often ask me why I do those things. And you know, the line that I use the most often is, I'm not looking for a distribution deal in Sweden today, but in five years when I might be, I've already had a 10-year relationship with this person who knows where I can find it, right? And it's just keeping myself open to those things and, and always having those opportunities just find us if we put the right energy in there. Um, I don't know that I have much more to say as far as networking and, and relationships um, and the organization. I feel like I covered what FMO is. Anyone who's been to FMO might have. Uh, is there, Sandy, is there It's anything? a really good time and you should it's go. <laughs> it's really okay. good time. You don't have to attend the whole conference. I brought a friend who'd never experienced folk music to the conference last year. She lived nearby. We knew each other through a sport. And I said, I know you want to meet for a drink, and I don't know if you're going to like this, and if you don't like it, we'll go hang out in the hotel bar. And she left on the edge of tears. She had so much fun, okay? Um, so if you're in the Toronto area this fall, get the evening to passes for the official showcases, and just go and experience. The best part about FMO is you don't know what you're going to fall exactly. Okay? You go, as friend, friend, uh, Freedom says, wide open. You go to experience what's going to get thrown at you, and you come out going, what was that? i got to see that again. And sometimes you go and you're like, hey, this one's not for me, but this one's for my dad. Or, yeah. you know, this is, my friend needs to hear this. And, you know, like I have an album in my car that I'm going to go give to Pete Swartz because he needs to hear it and take that band to his festival. They need to be there. Right. And that Which creates excitement. Further moments, right? takes you through. It's so, so great. It creates further moments. I was host it does. Uh, hosting a stage once and I was talking about festivals and, and just the importance of people attending festivals, right? And because there there are moments in festivals. There are moments in events like culture. Mm -hmm. There are moments in any show, any live art that you see. There are moments that you keep with you that mm -hmm. really can, can take you in a different direction in your life. So. Uh, always. I mean, I, I'm preaching to the choir here. You're all arts lovers. So. Um, but keep loving art and keep promoting it. I think David had something he wanted to add. Yeah, so <clears throat> I, work in, I work at Heritage, as you know. I work with Folk Music Ontario, and it's been nine years, so almost ten, I think, of continuous relationships. Get your cake. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, one of the things that I heard year after year at their conference was the complaint on the part of the festival members. That the, the network was created by the festivals, but it's been taken over by the musicians. And what about us? What about the festival? And it was all, <coughs> excuse me, it was this big complaint. And I, I had that sort of privileged moment of saying, well, why don't you tell your organization that you would like to do something more? Because to your point, Megan, how does a network exist beyond the, the time of the event when you know, the activity occurs and there's all the stuff in the background, but networking itself can happen at any time. So the fun part of this would be uh, out, of, out of this, um, a proposal came where uh, 
Music Ontario said, we'll do an annual event, a retreat, which is solely focused on the festivals, and it's for their executive and for their boards in order to be able to do professional development geared towards that, because that was the greatest need. And is it year five, I think, that we've been doing yes, this? Year five, yeah. And Four or five. it has grown to be the most important thing uh, Folk Music Ontario offers those festival members, but the, the net effect has been, they've learned a lot about each other, and my favorite part was the point where I'm sitting in front of them saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to shatter the silence here, I'm going to tell you all what you're, what you're funded for, so you know exactly who gets what, so there's no secrets anymore, and they're all like, what, going <laughs> to do that? But it's just about, you know, it, it creates this equalizer, it, takes the mystery out of things and just makes it something we can talk about. So why does Hillside get this much and why does River and Sky get this much and why does Mariposa get something different? Mm -hmm. And what, what can they do? And they, But they can talk to them amongst themselves about what they do as opposed to me as a funder sort of having to uh, somehow you know, do the schooling. It can be, it becomes a shared experience and that has made their applications way better, way stronger, more focused and much more inspirational. You know, they're not just phoning it in the way that they were five, ten years ago when I started. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, yeah, I really find that it, realizing that a network is a living thing and that it needs to evolve like is a big learning curve that I've had. Like, uh, I was talking that little bit about the task force and then going to the community lead model and creating that that online network and like similar to what you guys were saying about how the Folk Music Ontario network has had to change from being about performers to some of the organizations and um, I guess really learning that it can't be static and it's going to grow and age and be this living thing and you have to not try and hold it back and sort of really see what well, where it needs to have that growth and that TLC to be able yeah, to, how we to get to that next stage. Try to Contain it. it. Yeah. <laughs> Any other, I guess we can just move on to it. Eric, and then there will be questions later. We can have a great discussion with all the people in this room, and we can develop our own giant network of hospitals. <laughs> <laughs>
being active with Spark. Um, and eventually I got to this place with, with Ontario Presents where I was going to the same meeting, to, these, to the meetings, to the contact events, I was listening in on the conference calls, and I was he hearing the same people talking about artists that I could never otherwise afford, you know, to bring to my venue. Um, you know, Buffy St. Marie, um, Alan Doyle, you know, I mean, these are, you know, major headlining acts. Um, and a lot of music that, and specifically music, I mean, there was all it was dance, theater, everything, um, that really didn't speak to my audience, even if I could afford it. It's just, this is very much not, not something I can engage with. I mean, I can be interested in it personally, but it doesn't really speak to me. And then I go, I go to these contact events, and you watch all these showcases, and again, they seem like this is all very well and good, but it's not for me. So I, I kind of got to this place, oh, why isn't there a network for grumpy community hall <laughs> managers in small towns? Because that's, you know, that's what I need. Um, and, uh, and then I went to, uh, I, I didn't put in so many words, but I went to um, Blue Sky Day. In fall of 2016, so I'm trying to go for the timeline here. I'll try and shorten this up as best I can. But fall of 2016, I went to Ontario Presents Blue Sky Day. And I kind of said, you know what, there's... What about the smaller venues? What about the people who are running these... And there was a couple of us in the room that were, you know, 200, 300 seat venues, you know, not really interested in the big name artists. And I was like, okay, yeah, this is fair concern. Other people said, yeah, this is something that... You know, it's interesting, but kind of got left there. Um, and then I went a month later to the Spark Conference in, ha in Halliburton, the second Spark uh, Symposium, and I put on the, the, the board there um, for discussions, I said, small venues, go and talk to me about small venues. And that was sort of the eureka moment when we got those people in that room. And Sandy's we got him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, um, we, we kind of realized, oh, there, and there was a whole, this, this, we're all in the same boat. There's like 10 of us who are running these smaller venues in remote and rural communities, and we are totally lacking this kind of support. Um, and, you know, we, we saw a real need there. And fortunately, Jane Smythe from Ontario Presents was in the room uh, with us. Poor Jane. <laughs> uh, Didn't you drop her in it? <laughs> yeah. um, but no, Jane was there. Um, so she uh, she went back to Ontario Presents and said, okay, there's something here. Um, so a month later at Ontario Contact, uh, they organized a small venues discussion there as well and got some more perspective and some more venues on board and some of the people who aren't necessarily in rural venues um, coming to it. And, uh, and then they said, okay. We'll put this together. So in January of 2017, uh, they took about a dozen of us um, from small venues across the province, uh, took us to Toronto for a day and a half, and we sat in a sat in a room and we hashed it out and we created the Community Presenters Network. So that was that was a direct example of two organizations, Spark and Ontario Presents, who you know have have vastly different mandates and are are both in the performing arts, but the similarities kind of end there. Um, coming together, each contributing something essential, and creating something new. Um, and that something new has really blossomed into something that is actually moving forward. Um, you know, Kaylee is our, is, 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 continues to be our, our great, on, from an Ontario Presents perspective, um, but still our, our organizer. She is the one that organizes our conference calls and does all our logistics and back end and artist research and, you know, totally, totally super shout out to Kaylee because she's amazing. Oh. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, uh, so, and Ontario Presents continues to support what we're doing and Spark continues to be very supportive, supportive of what we're doing. Um, but we're booking tours. We're having we're having calls. We're collaborating. Um, you know, artists are going to get work in the next twelve months because of this network. You know, theaters are going to be booked. Tickets are going to be sold because of the work we've done to build this network. 
that would not otherwise have been done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I was trying to build my season by latching on to the big Ontario Presents tours, I just couldn't do it. Um, you know, I'd have shows on a Tuesday night and, you know, wherever. Um, and you can't do that all the time. Uh, sometimes you need Friday, Saturday, two small towns, you know, so, okay, Friday night, Fergus, Saturday night, Waterford, you know. All right, let's make it work. Um, we're, we're doing a lot of, uh, a lot of people in the network are very interested in um, learning from each other. Um, there's a real desire to just, to, to share resources, to share best practices, um, but also just to go and hang out at other people's facilities for a day. You know, um, just what's it like to follow you around for an afternoon on a show day? What do you do? How do you, you know, what, what's your process? Um, it sounds really, really simple, but, and I haven't, I haven't done it myself yet, and it's, it's, it is on my list to do, um, but the people who have done it have said this is just an amazing thing, just to hang out and watch somebody else work. Um, and we have a lot of, um, a lot of areas where we can learn from each other. We face a lot of similar pro problems, um, but we've solved, a lot of us have solved problems in similar ways. Um, you know, I was able to help out, I can't remember, I think it was Bob, with the, a whole bunch of volunteer resources, or somebody was redoing Katie. Yeah. yeah. It's like, okay, well, here you go. Here's my 150 page township approved volunteer management plan manual. Take the five things out of it that you might get. Um, but, uh, you know, having that resource has been really helpful. And I keep going back to the thing that makes it work is that um, it's not trying to replace anything. It's not trying to replace the conversations I have at Spark. It's not trying to replace the conversations I have at Ontario Presents. It's, it's adding in the things that weren't happening in those spaces in between. Um, so I think that that's really the value of the Community Presenters Network. And you know we're, we're still less than two years old. Um, we didn't exist two years ago at the last symposium. Uh, and we are still, we're very, where the network is going to go and grow and is still very much an open question. Um, you know, I had some, some small venues. I'm dealing with a box office issue um, over lunch, so I'm constantly checking my phone, sending text messages. But at the same time, I had it here on the funders <laughs> um, because the CPN still has no budget. So sooner or later, we're going to have to have that conversation about how do we fund the network. But you know, we are very open to how the network grows and develops and moves forward because that sort of openness is what got us to this point. You know, you said it best. You know, you don't go in with an agenda. You don't go in saying, this is what I want to do and this is what I, you know. You can go in with some general ideas, but, um, you know, when you have these kind of networking opportunities, you really do just have to sort of, give in to to the opportunity, to the network, to the people that are in the room and let everything they have to offer come to you. And, and that's when good things happen. So that was that's sort of the cold notes version of CBM. I, I tend to talk too much, so um, but uh, I think in terms of networking as Networking between networks, I think that that's sort of the key takeaway for me is is that you know networking is not just an individual thing that you do within a group of people. It's you know you do it with, on behalf of you know whatever name you know, could have said just as easily said community presenters network as as Fergus Grand Theater. You do whatever name is sitting at the bottom of your uh, of, of your your name tag. You know you're a representative. And you're 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 bringing your entire network to um, whatever discussion it is.